Well, well, Merry Christmas, everyone. We're so honored you're here. And uh, uh, we, um, this is our third year as a church, and we are so excited for what God's doing, and we're so excited for tonight. Um, you might wonder why am I so strange and have these up here. Um, you know, I love Christmas. Our first year of marriage, um, my wife and I, who played piano, she's amazing. And uh, she, yeah, thank you. You can clap for that. I mean... <laughs> So it was our first year Christmas, and as as a married couple, we're so excited. We're like, oh, man, we're married. What are we going to do? And we had very different ideas of how we were going to celebrate Christmas, right? So I grew up very much like the tree looked like they took the garbage can and just dumped it on top. And and my wife wanted the the pretty, you know, it all matched and and just odd things like that. And um, and so and so we kind of like compromised. And you should see our tree now just saying, I won, but it's okay. And... Um, <laughs> And our first year of marriage, we, uh, we got these nati- this nativity set, this ceramic nativity set. When my parents were first married, they went and bought a nativity set, and they, and they painted it themselves. And so I was like, well, that, they've been married 40 years. That helped them. Let's do that. And so, we, <laughs> and so we went, and we bought a nativity set, and then we started painting it. And we realized that painting a nativity set is not like a one-night project. It is like the month of December and January and March and April, I think. We skipped February. And so, um, but this, this is from our nativity set. And uh, when I was taking it today, the kids were like, what are you doing stealing our nativity set? And the, nativ- n- the nativity set is, for our kids and our family, the most exciting Christmas thing to put up. It is like a fight to put on what, and I am in, in charge, so I pick what, who puts what, and I let them put it on however they want, but then I go back and rearrange it later. Okay, that's how I, <laughs> that's how it goes. But there's uh, these two different people that are at the nativity set besides Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And there's the shepherds and there's the magi. And it's interesting because every nativity set you've ever seen or every Christmas story you've ever heard, it's the magi or the wise men and there's the shepherds. So I'm going to talk a little bit for a couple minutes about why is there shepherds and why is there magi. Are we good? So we're going to read a couple verses on the screen. First, we're going to talk about the shepherds. We're going to talk about the shepherds. Luke 2, verse 8, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But an angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I, give you, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So I don't know how it was when your kids were born, but when my kids were born, the first person that got to come and see my kids were my the parents and the grandparents and the brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, the immediate family. And it was this big deal. It was posted on Facebook. And it was, you know, like, here's the baby. And everyone's like, oh, my gosh, it's exciting. And here we have a, a, a God who, for about 300 to 400 years, goes silent and there's all this prophecy over the years about the coming of the Messiah. And all of a sudden, the Messiah is born. And if it's like the Messiah, who's kind of important to the world, you know, you'd think that the Messiah is going to be presented before kings and before family and is going to be paraded around. This is the Messiah, right? But God chooses to reveal the Son to a bunch of shepherds. So we know the story, we've heard it a thousand times, but it's a strange thing that that God would reveal his son to shepherds. Shepherds were not like what we would call upper middle class, right? Shepherds were really lowly. They were were mostly in the desert, in the fields, and at this moment, it's the middle of the night. They're up uh, watching over their flocks. They're making sure predators and no one comes and steals the, the sheep. And if I was picking someone to first see and meet the Messiah, it would not have been shepherds. Shepherds were poor. Shepherds were smelly. Shepherds did not have very much social equity, or they didn't have a lot of status. They were kind of the rejected people at that time. They were marginalized. They were like, go to the desert. They couldn't even fall within the religious structure, right? They couldn't keep Sabbath. They couldn't come and worship because they just weren't good enough or clean enough. Their job was to take care of sheep all the time in the middle of the desert. They were probably for the time, besides maybe the lepers, but they were the most rejected, ignored, alienated group of people at that time. And here God reveals himself first to shepherds. I I love that, because I don't know about you, my life, sometimes I've felt that way, a little smelly, a little rejected. (laughs) 
And all of a sudden, the angel appears to these shepherds, to these men in the desert, as they're just watching the sheep. And then it says this in verse 13. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those of whom his favor rests. So not only does, the sh- does God appear to the shepherds and the angel appear to the shepherds, but all of heaven opens up and they hear the song of heaven rejoicing that the Savior has been born, rejoicing that the Son has been born this day. And they didn't go to the city of Jerusalem where everyone was talking about the Messiah's coming. They went to the desert and found shepherds. And when the angels had left him and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened with, the Lord, with which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and, babe, and the baby who was lying in a manger. That seems like a good response. And heaven opens up and they're like, let's go do what they said. Let's do that, right? So, jo- so the, the shepherds go and they show up at the nativity and, and it's not this beautiful clean, clean uh, tent thing. It's a cave in the desert, and there they find the baby, and the mother, and the father. So that's the shepherds. God reveals himself to them first. He proclaims the coming of the Messiah to the shepherds first. I wouldn't have picked that. I wouldn't have just been like, opened the the hospital window and been like, hey, come see, street person, right? I wouldn't have done that. You you reserve the proclamation of your child for the most important people. But God chose to reveal himself first to shepherds and to show them who the Messiah was to the lowly. So that's the shepherds. Then there's what we call the magi, or the the kings, we three kings. The magi are a little interesting because there's not a ton of information about it. There's some speculation of who the magi were, but this is what happens when the magi come. And it says in Matthew chapter 2 that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, the magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw the star when it rose and have come to worship him. So the, the Magi are the wise men. A lot of people think um, the Magi were astrologers. They're watching the stars, right? They were, in some ways, the scientists of that day. They were, they were sorcerers, magicians. They were, they were the ones that they would they kind of sidle up to the king, and they would be the advisors. They would be the ones that are trying to like, make, make sense of it all and tell the king what he should do, right? Some, at that time, they, 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 for some reason, could have access to the king. So they come to Herod. They see the star. They're like, oh, that's a, that's a star. We were watching for this. We were watching to see when the king would come. And they go to the present king of the Jews, and they say, hey, we've come to see the king of the Jews. And Herod's like, uh, yeah, I'm the king of the Jews. He's like, uh, we saw the star. You're not the king of the Jews. And Herod starts to lose his mind. Get... <laughs> He's afraid, wait, there's another king? I'm the king. And if you know those days, right, not that it would be like that now, but there's conflict on both sides, right? <laughs> that was in the past. <laughs> so these, these wise men or these magi, these advisors to the king who were astrologers and sorcerers, and to the, at that time they were, they were learned and they were as educated as they could come. They come to the king and they ask, where's the king? And they says, I'm the king. And Herod's like, okay, go find that king. And, we'll, and I'll come and we'll worship it. And we all know the story, right, that Herod was going to kill Jesus. So the Magi go, and they find Jesus, and it says this. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and saw the star, and the star that they had seen when it rose and went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, And they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So God then reveals through the star, through the thing that the Magi understood, that there is a new king in town. And these people could come into the footsteps of other kings. These 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 guys had power, right? They had authority. They were smart. They were the ones that people would lean on, even kings would lean on. And God reveals it, that the coming of the king was, he revealed it to them as well. So why does God choose to reveal himself first to shepherds, and then he reveals himself to wise men or magi? 
In so many ways, that is a declaration of God's love for all people. That is the declaration that God and Christianity and the being, becoming a follower of Jesus is not just about being a certain social class. It's not just about learning it all and knowing it all, and it's not even about being in a certain rank and file. That God could have presented his son, the son that he so loved. He could have, at the top of the mountain for all to see, he could have brought, it, brought the declaration of the angel to Jerusalem for everyone, and there would be no question who he was. And God chose to go to the lowly, and then he chose to go to the high ranking. It's the beauty of the gospel that Jesus came for all people in that range. That not one person is left out of his love. We know know the verse that God so loved the world. That God would love the shepherd as much as the highly esteemed. That he would love and, and serve the marginalized as well as the most highly ranking that he would, he would love the second rate. He would love those who lived outside of the norms and those who lived in palaces. He would love those who have rejected a religious system. And he would love those who are searching for God in anything they can. And the beauty of the declaration of the son and the baby is it's the story of God's love for all people. Jesus came for the lowly, the marginalized, as well as the educated and the wise. Jesus came, the baby came that day, for the highly ranked and the lowly, for the minority and the majority, for those who have been rejected by religious systems or who have given up on church, for those who have searched far and wide. God, Jesus has come for those who have messed up their life. And it's come for those who have tried to live totally perfect. He's come to save kings. He's come to save scientists and shepherds and white collar and blue collar. Jesus came to save those who watch MSNBC and Fox News (laughs) equally. Jesus came, whether you have a PhD or a GED. I love the story of the nativity. It is, it is a story that I am as accepted by God. It's a story that whether I feel like I'm the shepherd, I've, I'm just a mess and I got nothing to give and I've messed up too many times and I've been rejected too many times or I feel like I got this all together and I'm ready to go. That whole range, God sent his son to die for and to love. For God so loved the world. And something profound happened when each group of these people encountered the the child. This is what it says in verse 17 of Luke chapter 2, when the shepherds come. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her hearts. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which, which were just as they had been told. So these were shepherds, though. Like, no one would talk to the shepherds. No one would listen to shepherds. They just tend the sheep. They stay in the desert. Leave us alone. Take care of the sheep. We'll take care of everything else. And encountering the child gave them so much hope and so much excitement that they went out and proclaimed, this is who the Savior is. So God took the lowly, and he didn't just say, well, now you can be lowly. He said, no, I'm going to use you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to make your life matter, and I'm going to give you purpose in your days. You will no longer just be a lowly shepherd. You will be my child. You will be my mouthpiece. You will be the one who proclaims who the Son is. When you encounter God, It changes your purpose forever. And then the Magi, these guys were like all put together. You know, it was about status and about keeping everything going and presenting that they have it all together. And when they encounter the Son of God, they had been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod and they returned to their country another route. So they say, we are out of here. They rejected their own uh, pride And they rejected their own ability to stay in power in that country for the king. 
So if you ever wonder about God's love for you, if you ever wonder about this whole thing of faith and in Christ, you can look and you can say, it started with the shepherd and it ended with the magi, and all of us are in between there someplace. And he says, I'm going to love each one of you. I'm going to serve each one of you. I'm going to be close to each one of you, no matter what. You guys can come up. Get ready to play. So you ever feel like you're a shepherd? Do you ever feel like, man, I've blown it too many times. It's better if I just go away. Then God doesn't have to deal with me. Then people don't have to deal with me. Or I think this is another thing we do. I think a lot of us feel like magi. I have to have it all together. I have to project and proclaim that I got it all figured out. And God has come and he's told us through this love of his son that all people are in need of this Savior. That all people can come to God. That he has not left anyone out of that equation. And he proclaimed it right away. And he says, there's no question of why this child came. Didn't come, he didn't come to sit on a throne and rule the people. He came to show himself to the, those who feel that they have the least. And he came to show himself to those who feel like they have the most. And he came to say that wherever you are on that spectrum, you need me. And I've come to serve you. And I've come to be with you. And I've come to be your savior. Wherever you are. One of my favorite verses right now is in Hebrews 4. It says, For we do not have this high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are and did not sin. So we don't have this, this baby didn't come to be the king and to make sure that everything was fine. This Savior came and he went through every single thing that we go through. Every bit of temptation and rejection and pain and struggle and fear, he went through it and he overcame it and he went to the cross perfect and he saved our lives. So we have a savior that empathizes from the sh- with all of us from the shepherd to the magi. And then it says this, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So whether you've been a follower of Jesus for five seconds or for 50 years, we're all in that spectrum of shepherd to wise men, and we all need a savior. And God says, he says, you should come to me. Come to me. Because you know what? We all, in our own way, are broken. We all have struggles. We all have things that we struggle with, including me, maybe the most. But the hope I have is that he came for the shepherd, the lowly. And he came for the highly esteemed. And each are equally in need of a Savior. And that's why Jesus came. Can I pray for you? Lord God, we thank you for this day. God, I pray for every person here. God, you know their hearts. You know their past. You know their future. You know the things they struggle with, the doubts they have. You know, God, whether they feel or live as a shepherd or, as they, or they're trying to strive to be a magi. God, I pray that right now in the name of Jesus that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would show us that, you know what, ultimately what we need is a savior. Ultimately what we need is the savior of the world to come and join with us in this life and to change our purpose, change our perception, change our minds and our hearts to be more like him so that we can live a more fulfilled life, so we can have hope and joy when there is none around us, so that we can have salvation for this life and for the next, so we can experience the good things that God has done and wants to do. So it starts with an approach. We can approach God with confidence. So with everyone's eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you, am I going to embarrass you or freak you out? I promise. I'm not going to have you, you know, It'll, it'll be fine. Say, hey, I want to I approach God. I want to come to God. I want to, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a wise man or I'm a, I'm a shepherd, God, and I realize at this moment I need you. I want to experience you again. Maybe for the first time or maybe again for, for a, it's been a while. 
And if that's you with everyone's eyes closed, no one look up, please. Just shoot up your hand really high. I just want to know you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Anyone else? Yep. Anyone else? Yeah. Anyone else? Amen. You put your hands down. Lord, thank you so much for the love you have for all of us. God, would you remind each of us right now, Lord, of your deep love that, bes- that goes beyond our even understanding. And God, thank you that we don't have to have every answer now, and we don't have to trade in our intellectualism, God, for relationship with you. We don't have to trade in a certain, a certain way we think for you. God, you're going to work that out. You're going to speak into our hearts because you want to use those who are are in all spectrums of life for your glory. So God, just speak to us more and more. And thank you, God, that you are restoring and renewing hearts right now, that we are approaching you with with confidence because you are our God. And we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. And would you stand with me? As we sing this last song, uh, when I was a little kid, we would uh, go to this little Lutheran church in the middle of North Dakota. And I would uh, be very um, bored until this time. And one of the things that is so precious to my life is seeing my family and my grandparents who are now gone um, singing Silent Night with lighted candles and remembering that Jesus is the light of the world that shines for all to see and that light that is in me and that is in you will never go out. So as we sing this, sing it with all you got. As you light your candle, just remember that God is putting a light inside of you. So let's sing this together.